so my name is uh, Ian Burrell, and I'm working on a time domain nuclear resonance under the supervision of Dr. Ngadi for my MSc. If you've heard of NMR before or nuclear resonance, you've probably heard of it in the context of determining chemical structure, where you, you have several peaks and peaks represent different bonds. However, time domain nuclear resonance is quite different. For starters, it uses unpurified compounds, so you can have a macroscopic magnetization of a whole bunch of different atoms. Uh, instead of having purified compounds. There's a different mathematical process to obtain a legible signal, and it's not just a Fourier transform. For starters, we need to obtain a nuclear magnetic signal, and to do that we need active nuclei, so not all nuclei are active. Subatomic particles, like protons and neutrons, have a spin. That spin produces a magnetic moment, and that magnetic moment is what's going to give us a signal. However, the spins on the protons and the neutrons make cancelling moments. It doesn't cancel out the spin, just the moment. Uh, therefore, to be NMR active, you have to have an odd number of, well, an uneven number of protons versus neutrons. Luckily, hydrogen is just a proton, so it has no neutron to cancel out the magnetic moment. Uh, luckily, it is ubiquitous in food in the form of water, or water would produce the largest signal. Water environments exist in proteins, tightly bound to proteins, in cells, out of cells, and even free. And uh, these protons act like bar magnets. A bar magnet is kind of what we see behind my slides. It produces a magnetic field, and it lines up north-south with the south-north, right? So south points towards north, north towards south. Um, so this it's the axis of rotation that lines up with the permanent magnet, not the, uh, not the spin itself. So it spins perpendicular to the uh, orientation, we'll call that orientation B0. Then we're going to use radio frequency pulses, RF pulses, to tilt that angle of rotation to another direction. Say if you flip it on its side, 90 degrees, that'd be called transverse or relaxation, depending on your experiment. And as you let go of the RF pulses, it returns to B0. That return is a changing magnetic field and it induces a current in the wire. That current is what we read as a signal. Because when it's fully aligned with B0, there is no signal, it's a decaying signal from its alignment to B0. That's why our signal is called free induction decay, and also explains why it's called NMR, so nuclear reactive nuclei, magnetic resonance, and then you have radio frequency that causes the resonance and the tilting, thus NMR. So time domain NMR is different because it looks at time, so the speed at which it returns to its uh, first position. So let's say a water inside a protein is tightly bound, being pulled on very hard by the proteins and the atoms inside the protein, uh, and thus returns very quickly to B0. Eolized water, such as water inside cells, is also being pulled on, but not nearly as hard, so it returns slightly slower. Free water, like you just have water in a container, would return very, very slowly, uh, orders of magnitude slower than any of the other two options. In meat, this doesn't tend to exist, but we'll talk about that later. So the process of obtaining a signal is uh, quite long and complicated with time domain NMR, as we can see here. And the signal itself uh, produces little to no information when you look at it. So this is examples of signals, um, and they look like that for almost all the samples. Uh, by eye, you can't really notice any sort of difference or obtain much information. So a lot of it happens through mathematics. The signal follows a distribution that resembles that on the top. And if you recognize that section of the equation there, that's a Laplace transform, by definition. So if you, you obtain a signal that's already Laplace transformed. If you reverse it, you also go from discrete to continuous in your signal. And in the case of meat, which I'm working on, if you get it right, you'll obtain three peaks. However, it's difficult to get it right because there's an infinite possible solution that will obey that equation. So you have to set your initial values and boundary conditions correctly to obtain something like this. If you do, in the case of meat, it'll produce three peaks, each peak representing a different uh, water environment. So first is that found in protein. The second is intramyofibular, which is basically water stuck in cells, but for meat it's called myofibular. Extramyofibular is outside of the cells. There's no such thing as free water in this case because it would simply leak out and you would lose it. The integral underneath each peak, the area under the peak, is the proportion of water pertaining to that section of the meat. And that gives us a lot of information. Like I spoke of before, transverse relaxation, where we tilt it on its side and let it come back, and if it produces three peaks, will correlate strongly with water holding capacity. The sign of this is interesting because for the consumer, it translates to juiciness and tenderness of the product, two very important quality attributes. So as you can see, it's quite useful, and there are many benefits. It's non-destructive. You can sell the sample afterwards. 
It's fast, it takes only about 30 seconds. Safe, no chemicals, no danger, no grinding, no heat. Um, and if you use other experiments that aren't T2, for example, you can get fat content, protein content, unsaturation of the fat. You can even saturation, whoops. And uh, it can be used on non-meat products, although I'm focusing on meat. Um, and it measures the whole entire product, not just the surface, like other forms of imaging might do. And it can be done in line on a conveyor belt in the facility. So lots of benefits. I'd like to thank uh, my primary reviewers, secondary reviewers, uh, Dr. Ngadi, and uh, the people I learned NMR with this summer. Here are my references. Any questions?